The Nikon D3300 is one of the best entry-level DSLRs out there right now. But does it work for you two? Today we're going to be taking a look at the Nikon D3300, specifically its video capabilities. The D3300 has become one of the most popular entry-level DSLRs recently, and for good reason. It's a very capable camera for only $400. I've had this camera for about 7 months now and decided it was finally time to make a review. So that's exactly what we're going to do today. But before we get into the type of image you can pull from this camera, let's take a look at the camera's body. Right off the bat, the first thing I noticed was how sturdy it feels. For only $400, I expected something much cheaper feeling, but this camera doesn't feel cheap at all. It's got a nice weight to it and has a very ergonomic handle for handheld shooting. On the side, we have our SD card slot. I use a 32GB card with it and have never filled it up all the way, and I often have up to 200 or more full HD videos. So that's not really something you're going to have to worry about. On the other side, you also have an AV slash USB out port, a micro HDMI and a mic jack. This is the big one here. Having a mic jack is what really puts this camera above the others of its price range in terms of video. The biggest port you are missing is the headphone jack, but for the type of people who will be using this camera, that's not too big of a deal. On the bottom of the camera is your battery compartment. This is a very annoying place for this to be since if you have this mounted on your tripod or a quick release plate, you can't change the battery without unscrewing the mount. But again, this is just a small complaint considering the very low price tag on this camera. On the top, you have the on and off switch, our record button, mode dial, and aperture control button. I use this one all the time. There are also two other customizable function buttons, one here and one on the front. On the back, you have a pretty decent LCD screen with 10 stops of brightness so you can see your screen in most situations. The menu system is really intuitive and easy to navigate. Right up front on the display, without ever going into the menu, we have quick access to some of our most used features like white balance, shutter speed, ISO, and aperture. In our menu, we have some different settings which we have to kick the dial into manual mode to access. Here you can switch between a few different picture profiles, standard, neutral, vivid, monochrome, portrait, and landscape. I usually use neutral. You also have a choice between two different color scopes. I prefer to use Adobe RGB because I found it keeps more realistic skin tones than just normal RGB. Finally, in the movie settings, you can choose video quality under frame size slash frame rate. There's full HD 1920 by 1080 in 60 FPS, 30 FPS, and 24 FPS. There's also 1280 by 720 HD at 60 FPS and 424 SD. Below that is movie quality, which is basically the bit rate. You have high and standard. Then you have microphone settings. I always keep mine in manual and set it to something around 8. If you're wondering what the in-camera audio sounds like, here you go. I am currently recording on the Nikon D3300's in-camera audio. And as you can hear, it's pretty noisy and not really usable. But you can easily get around this by just plugging in an external shotgun mic. This is just something you're going to have to deal with since it's only a $400 camera. But that's the body and menu, so let's dive right into a, at it with a look at the image quality you can pull from this camera. All of these shots were shot with a kit lens, neutral picture profile, and custom white balance. I was very impressed with the footage I was able to grab with this camera. This made me curious how well the D3300 could hang with more expensive cameras, so I put it up against my Panasonic G7 in a well-lit scene. And as you can see, the G7 blows away the Nikon, but for only $400, it held up pretty well. I really enjoyed shooting with this camera, but the main problem I had with it was pulling focus. It's very hard to pull focus through the LCD screen, especially in the bright sun, and the viewfinder is not extremely sharp. Let's take a look at the raw footage, and as you can see, it's very flat and has a fairly decent dynamic range for such a cheap camera. However, it certainly handles shadows better than highlights. It tends to blow out the highlights on bright days. Next, we come to low light, which is where you can definitely tell it's a $400 camera. It's sort of typical and not horrible, and can still be used if you light properly, but it's definitely not great. So you can see what I mean, here's a lens cap test. The 
The highest ISO I would shoot with on this camera is 800. Beyond that, and it starts to get unusable with all that noise. Before we're done, I have two last quick things to mention about this camera. The first one would be that the autofocus on this camera is terrible. Most filmmakers don't ever use autofocus, but I thought I would mention it anyway. The autofocus on this camera is really loud, and you will always hear it if you have a shotgun mic or something like that. And last, we have photography. I feel like I should throw out there that this is an excellent camera for photography. It takes 24 megapixel photos, and I've even taken this camera on several real estate shoots. So here are some of my favorite shots I've taken with this camera. That's all for today. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. We make new filmmaking tutorials and reviews every Monday.